Hi, everyone, and welcome to the sixth and final session today of our Climate Health and Healthcare Speaker Series. Today, our um, session will be focused on patient and planetary health, lessons from Indigenous knowledge systems, and we're so excited to welcome our two amazing speakers for tonight, Nicole Redvers and June Kaminsky. Um, so if you attended previous sessions, tonight's going to work similarly, so our, our speakers are going to give their talks, and at the end, we'll read out questions from the audience uh, and do a Q&A. So feel free um, to type your questions in the Q&A or send them to Vienna and I anonymously, and we will make sure to ask them during the question period. And as a final reminder, if you are interested in participating in the certificate program, please submit your reflections by May 25th. And again, we sent out an email a couple weeks ago with the instructions for that and the link to the submission form. Okay, um, so before we get started, we do want to do uh, a land acknowledgement. Um, so we wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. Uh, for thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and then most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and to learn uh, on this land. Um, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Nicole Redvers. Um, and she is an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine in the Department of Indigenous Health at the University of North Dakota, where she helped develop and launch the first Indigenous Health PhD program. And we are very excited and grateful to have her here today to give us a talk. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here. So bear okay. with me for one moment. And let's go ahead and do that. And then I'll just make the assumption that you can see my slides okay and that you can hear me okay. Okay. Perfect, wonderful. Well, uh, happy to be here as noted. Um, really an honor to, uh, to participate and, and uh, listen also to our, our other speaker today and, and have a discussion uh, with you all. One of the things that I think uh, is important to note when it comes to anything in regards to the context of the conversation is that when I speak from my own Indigenous way of being, way of knowing, but also my lived experience, it's important to note that it's been informed by tens of thousands of years of memories that are stored in my region stories. And stories are our main method, if we could say, rooted directly in the lands that we come from. And I really like George Kajadi, who aptly describes this relationship very well, stating that the culture's vitality is literally dependent on individuals in community with the natural world. Indigenous cultures are an extension of the story of the natural community of a place and evolve according to ecological dynamics and natural relationships. Therefore, I always must honor my ancestors and my elders as anything I share or talk about from my Indigenous way of being is not my knowledge, it's, it's not my area of expertise. It's instead a collective uh, knowing of a group of people that stretches thousands of years uh, from the place that I come. I'm a member of the Deninuque First Nation up in Denede, which is Treaty 8 territory. Uh, Dene, Dene peoples, who we are. De means flow. Ne means land. So our peoples are literally flowing from the land. So even though there's a metaphorical connection with how we describe ourselves, there's also that physical connection of us being in and of nature. Now, our Indigenous methodologies, if we could stay for, for well-being, stem from a, a rooted decolonized state of being that is premised on sometimes what you'll hear, I think easily described in, in these types of contexts as for ours, which is that of respect, relevance, reciprocity, and also responsibility with really direct and foundational underpinnings, but also transferability in how we see our kinship relationships with all planetary uh, elements and beings, whether or not it's from the micro level all the way up to the macro level. And how we think through or this idea of how we formulate our relationships in the, in the world, are, are rooted in a framework of knowing that prizes interconnectedness. And interconnectedness is, is foundational. 
in terms of how we see the world, but also embodies some of the natural laws that many of our communities uh, uh, will relate to very well. So when thinking ab about how we turn this interconnected relationship to land, and I use land in this instance with a capital L, meaning something we have a relationship to comparatively to land with a small L, more of a geographic kind of place. So how do we turn this interconnected relationship to land with a capital L into a methodology for health and, and well-being? And of course, there, there already is a methodology. There's been a healing method in, in existence for, for thousands of years and how to live and, and heal sustainably. And all are based on sacred natural laws, which then define what we call our traditional pro protocols or guidelines for life, if we could say, which then give a framework for the modern world scholarship, healing, and even governance. Now, Planetary health itself is a relative newcomer, if we could say, in the Western way of thinking and, and applying knowledge. And although the conceptualizations of planetary health have been around in indigenous communities for thousands of years, it was formally defined in English in the last 10 years or so. And the original uh, origins in Western applications of planetary health were frankly very anthropocentric in nature, meaning human centric. And this is still somewhat the case to get today in some circles. However, this is improving substantially. And the Planetary Health Alliance recently actually changed their definition to encompass this more wide ranging approach to planetary health, which many of you may have been exposed to in, in previous teachings, but just in case they've defined planetary health as a solutions oriented transdisciplinary field and social movement focused on analyzing and addressing the impacts of human disruptions to Earth's natural system on human health and all life on Earth. Now, the planetary health movement seems to have struck a chord with many health professions, with many health systems around the world adopting or signing on to planetary health movements, recognizing the important role that healthcare providers play within this area. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. And there's still a lot of work to be done. However, with more exposure, we are seeing more awareness in this area, thankfully. Now, considering an indigenous approach, Planetary health as a field is really primarily a, a Western construct as indigenous traditional knowledge systems really have no clear separation between the health of the planet and the health of self or even that of the community and the ecosystem at large. So when we think about planetary health, especially from an indigenous perspective, we can think of it as being nested into an interconnected relationship with other innate and also applied knowledges, which then impact the health of our communities and ecosystems. So this, this bi-directional impact of, of various nested levels of being of reality um, are, are really important in how we think through our reality, just as much as we are bound by some of the constants that exist in the world. The sun will continue to rise in the east, the tides will be affected by the moon. But we are impacted in, in many different ways in a bi-directional uh, 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 manner. This means that the, the meaning and applications of planetary health are directly rooted in community values based on protocols for living in harmony with all that has existed for thousands of years. It is very contextual to land and to place and to space. Now, I wanna switch back a little bit uh, to some of the health-related considerations that are, that are gaining more attention as we see this increasing nexus between cl uh, climate and health, but, but how we might be able to think through this in, in practice, in medical practice. Now, in the last few years, I coined the term patient planetary health co-benefit prescribing, which is an overarching terminology that I've used to denote any prescribing practice or clinical advice given 
that explicitly takes into account both the patient's and the planet's health in the action of prescribing. And prescribing I use very broadly in this case, medical advice given, um, you know, counseling, whatever the terms that we wanna use. But again, the, the sort of prescribing nature is very much a, a Western kind of approach to thinking through this, but it makes sense for a lot of clinicians that are trained within this area. So why, why the need for this terminology? <laughs> And, and I, as I noted before, I'm a member of the Denukwe First Nation from, from the lands of Denede in Subarctic Canada. And, and my indigenous community has had, just like many indigenous communities, has a traditional indigenous medicine system that has existed for thousands of years, that is evidence informed, is empirical, it is time tested, it is sustainable, and it is net zero. In fact, I would suggest that you know it goes beyond and actually it, it is in the negative in terms of uh, re realistic practice. And in our traditional medicine systems, the environment is not separated from the patient. They are utterly and completely interconnected. Any treatment, any prescription, if we could say, and a recommendation is done in concert with the patient's reciprocal respect and responsibility to the lands and waters around. There is therefore absolutely no separation between the health of the patient as noted and the health of the planet. In the consideration for a prescription, they are joined. And in, and in fact, many prescriptions or treatments are done with this specific intent to ensure there are co-benefits for the patient and for the environment and planet. For example, we have a traditional medicine that when it's picked for its use, it actually grows better. However, when you don't pick it, it stops growing well. It needs to be groomed and it needs the attention of us, the stewards of the lands. Now we engage with this plant by asking for its medicine and in return, the, the plant medicine thrives. So co-benefits is a term that is now often used in many sustainability fields and circles. And a co-benefit approach considers how climate change mitigation initiatives can also advance other policy goals while also leading to improvements in health. Patient planetary health co-benefit prescribing. Now, many of you in probably previous modules or learnings have, have noted or, or hopefully have heard about some of the impacts on prescriptions within uh, the context of Western healthcare settings. Um, and for those, just in case that haven't, this example really is on meter dose inhalers or MDI inhalers used for asthma and other lung conditions. And meter dose inhalers or MDIs have been identified as, as one, uh, one of, uh, of the prescriptions that has a large environmental footprint uh, being a, a potent greenhouse gas emitter. One 100 dose MDI inhaler is the equivalent to about a 290 kilometer car journey. However, dry powder inhalers, on the other hand, that do not have the chemical propellant uh, to push the medication out of the inhaler, which is actually what is the cause of the global warming gas issues, doesn't have as much of an impact. Now, in many cases, the use of a dry inhaler will give the same benefit to an asthma patient that an MDI inhaler will, with the exception of small children and elderly people who sometimes need the support of the propellant. But MDIs are, are however, the most commonly used inhaler device. And, and there is only now being small amounts of education and awareness being done to educate healthcare providers on this fact and the options patients have in deciding on an appropriate prescription. Now, what I propose is that it's very reasonable to actively engage in shared decision-making with patients where not only the patient pros and cons are discussed as a part of the treatment plan and decisions, but also the pros and cons to the planet of a respective treatment. Hence, patient planetary health co-benefit prescribing. Now, one of the other examples of patient planetary health co-benefit prescribing is, is nature prescribing or land engagement, land healing. There's a numbers of different words that we use that's more contextual to the community experience or within indigenous communities specifically. And nature connectedness is essentially the extent to which individuals include nature as part of their identity, as part of themselves. And recent research has found that nature exposure and, and feeling this connectedness uh, within nature at a trait level provides many benefits to humans, such as uh, improvements in well-being, which of course is no surprise to many indigenous communities. 
However, to support nature connectedness clinically, you know, is another uh, uh, question. And I think the research has been quite clear in terms of the benefits. And I, I always, and I know that the park prescription people, uh, nature prescriber uh, folks like to point out this particular study, which was uh, very well done, uh, denoting that there was a hard boundary of about two hours of being in nature before any sort of uh, benefits, health benefits were shown. And what was really amazing is that the effects of the two hours spent within nature really were quite robust, cutting across different occupations, ethnic groups, people from rich and poor areas, and people with chronic illnesses and disabilities. Nature does not discriminate because it is, is a part of us. And, and when we have those connections deep with inside of us, the benefits are, are, are absolutely clear. Now, what I want to additionally point out is that research also has demonstrated that connecting with nature can also increase a sense of stewardship for our natural environment. By engaging and connecting within nature, people are more likely to want to protect nature. Patient planetary health co-benefit prescribing. Now, in thinking through the lens of the world, it, it really clearly affects how we see our innate hierarchy of ourselves over all other beings on the planet. And I really like this picture because I think it does a really good job. And there's there's been adaptations of this done in various capacities, but this uh, was done from the Mayan worldview, demonstrating that anthropocentric or the human-centric kind of approach that really underpins a lot of our lived experience today within modern society. Um, and this kind of colonial way of, of thinking with humans really being on the top of the pyramid and all other life forms in existence on earth falling under this sort of I, this ego, this individualistic approach, um, comparatively to the cosmocentric or ecocentric uh, component, this, this eco, this we perspective, where humans, the, the two-legged, are just a small little component of this greater system of relationship that occurs with all other elements on the planet. And that worldview, that view of, of how we see that really affects so many aspects of, of uh, thinking through research questions, th developing you know, um, medical protocols, how we think through interacting with patients, everything's interconnected in that way. Now, health equity considerations generally, I think in research and practice are thankfully getting a little bit more attention. They're becoming more common in terms of the, the conversations that occur. Uh, what is also important as denoted here on this page, however, is an interspecies equity approach that we're broadening our, our thought prospects on what health equity mean to include all relations that exist on the planet. Um, seeing this relationship um, broadly um, and, and underpinning relationality in the decisions that we, we make, whether or not it's within healthcare or outside healthcare. We were all interconnected uh, with no hierarchy between us when it comes to how the natural systems operate in the world. And I often talk about equity from many different lenses. Uh, on the previous slide, Interspecies equity, of course, was highlighted. However, we also have to understand notions of intergenerational equity, which is a prime consideration for Indigenous communities often making decisions based on the effects of the next seven generations to come. Uh, and that was, you know, been clarified in, in many circles, including by the Rockefeller Foundation with their Lancet Commission on, on Planetary Health, stating we've been mortgaging the health of future generations to realize the economic and development gains in the present. Now, just to sort of tie things up, uh, the, the, the interconnected nature that I keep talking about, um, and in this case, the interconnected nature generationally, is also depicted uh, here on this slide. And we could think of ourselves as unified communities due to this interconnectedness on all fields of structure and influence, yet there's also a clear interrelationship with repercussions for not living in balance with the planet. As what we call earth-centered jurisprudence systems, um, you know, earth law, govern both natural and global systems because there is this unity of natural laws between us, between us and ecosystems because we are of nature, we are governed by the same systems. As noted previously, the sun will continue to rise from the east and set in the west. The moons will continue to affect the tides 
but Mother Earth will also respond to our interactions with her, with, which ultimately uh, affects all other life forms because we are nested again into these interconnected relationships on the planet, affecting the health of our communities and ecosystems. Um, and these really help to form our reality just as much we are, are bound by some of these constraints. So in thinking through this vision for a healthy future, it's really important to create the conditions that enable the overcoming of the dissonance between being in nature, this idea of you know, going out into nature, nature that surround us, comparatively to being of nature, nature that embodies us. And one of the best ways I think to think about that for a lot of people is you'll hear indigenous communities sometimes saying that I come from the mountain or you know, I come from this river or come from this lake. And what I often you know, describe to scientists sometimes is you know, what percent of your body is water? Of course, around 60% water. And where does your water come from? comes from the tap. No, no, further back, where does it come from? And, you know, the water treatment plant. No, further back than that, you know, most often it will come from a water body existing around, whether or not it's a river, whether or not it's a lake. Um, and the fact that you're drinking that lake water, the river water, you are lake, you are river, you are, you know, pond, wherever those water molecules have come from, the journeys that they've been through are now in you, embodied in you as part of the wisdom of nature. That interconnectedness is not only metaphorical, but on a physiological level as well. Now, as noted, the planetary health movement is gaining significant traction in and around both universities and organizations in North America, but also Europe and abroad, which of course is very positive. Um, however, I remind folks constantly that planetary health is by no means a new innovative discipline that's just popped up and, and is sometimes suggested in academic circles, but a deeply rooted connection that all of our ancestors had to this land as a medicine place. And, and to understand the planet and its functions is to understand oneself in the indigenous worldview. And if the climate movement, turn that back, if the climate change movement broadly and, and, and everything that encompasses that, whether it's biodiversity, pollution, if all of those movements are to be successful, it will need to platform itself as more culturally safe, critically conscious, and have a greater appreciation of currently often marginalized Indigenous voices. We cannot forget in the complexity, however, that as Terry T.G. and, and a number of First Nations and Indigenous Métis, Inuit peoples, you know, often say in different ways, take care of the land and the land will take care of you. I hope folks have heard about the planetary pledge, a planetary health pledge, if you have not, uh, something to look up to uh, um, and, and read. It really is meant to be inspiration to think through how, uh, as health providers, we see our role and responsibility as stewards of this planet as well. So with this, I want to say Masi Cho, thank you for your time and attention today. And I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to be with you here. There are, of course, deep and vast topics, but I hope this brief introduction will stimulate some thought and consideration. And, and I'm sure, of course, uh, with uh, June, the coming speaker, we'll, we'll hear much more. And uh, I look forward to the discussions to come. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing screen. And, and uh, let's see here. There we go. Thank you so much, Dr. Redvers, for sharing your insight. That was such an amazing presentation and it gave us so much to think about for sure. Um, I'm going to introduce the next speaker now. So June Kaminsky. So she has served as nursing faculty and curriculum coordinator at, the, at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in BC for the past 33 years. She is currently involved in Kane as the communications officer and webmaster. And you can go ahead and share your screen whenever you're ready. Well, it's really great to be here with you all, and it's wonderful to follow Dr. Redvers's wonderful presentation. I just wanted to start with um, acknowledging that I am joining this session from the West Coast, so from the traditional unceded uh, territories of the Squamish, Desalitut, and Musqueam nations, who have been on this sacred land for thousands of years. 
I wanted to follow and finish up this series by sharing some seeds with you, some ideas that I've often shared with my own nursing students. Um, I've clustered them here as fundamental teachings that are time-honored ways of looking at the world that I really encourage all of you to consider adopting. And these can be summarized as in this, as they are in this list, as the seven generations, all my relations, looking at four directions and holistic balance, four pillars of learning, developing a connection to place, being stewards of the land, and walking softly on the earth with the earth, learning together experientially and raising our voices together. seven generations. Again, this is a very, very um, cursory overview of these philosophies. These are something that need to be lived. But just to give you an idea and to plant a seed, hopefully in your mind, is that if we adopt a wide angle lens, it's the best way to look at planetary health, pre pre preventing environmental degradation, etc. If we look at the wisdom of the ages, the past, the past seven generations, then also forward to the seven to come. So if you think of your children, your grandchildren, and so forth, for the next seven generations, how can you work with others to preserve the planet for, for these people to get to come? So looking at the indigenous way is not one of just living in the past, but continually adapting to the now, and considering the impact of all of our actions on the seven generations to come. So whether it's related to health, or related to the environment, etc., we should consider this. Thus, Western thinking could be enriched if some of the processes naturally. June, so, so June, sorry to interrupt you. Your mic, the mic is a bit muffled. I'm not sure if it's like bumping something. Is there any way maybe you could move it away or something? Is that better? Yes, that's much better. Okay, sorry, it was. Thank a fan. you so much. Okay, that's okay. perfect. Thank you. No problem. So basically, Western thinking could be enriched if some of the processes naturally used in Indigenous cultural thought were adopted. And some would call this two-eyed thinking, um, two-eyed seeing, and so forth. So we can all adopt a more balanced, holistic, and ecologically responsible mindset that could enhance the health and well-being of all on this planet. Another seed is all my relations and interconnectedness. And looking at how relationships need to be fully embraced and looking at how people and their families are strongly connected to the communities they live in, as well as their ancestors and future descendants, the land they live on, and all of the plant, animal, and other creatures that live around them. This mindset is you know, it shows deep respect and also cultivates protective caring, which is needed to stop all of the problems we're seeing, climate change, loss of habitat, species extinction, and so forth. You know, the water degradation and so much else is happening that needs to stop. Another seed would be looking at our own health in the context of four directions. So looking at body, mind, heart, and spirit, that all of these need to be balanced for a healthy, healthy life. And this is, I know in the nursing education stream, this is strongly emphasized, um, but this is not a, a new construct. It's been around for thousands of years, but where indigenous people have identified the importance of articulating this and teaching their children this and so forth. So traditional belief systems defined health as a life lived in balance with all other systems, whether you're looking at the family, the community, the environment, and so forth. So this holistic balance helps to reinforce that healing is like a journey. It requires daily input, daily balancing activities and movement, preferably within uh, nature, within, I know, in context of the land itself and it can fortify us in all four directions. Another aspect that uh, 
I'd like to borrow is called the Four Pillars of Indigenous Learning. Now these aren't, but these aren't new constructs. They were uh, written about by Verna Kirkness and Ray Barnhead back in 2001 called the Four R's and in the context of education, which also fits uh, this um, webinar and so forth, but looking at respect and looking at how we can protect all who live on the planet, having respect for all, how we can apply relevance and forge a relationship with nature that has personal meaning to us. But to me, that is the key to get involved in any kind of environmental movement is to have a personal relationship with the earth. Also developing reciprocity where we interact in a dance-like reciprocity with all living things in respect and honor and allowance, etc., and also um, bringing responsibility into it, becoming stewards for the earth, becoming stewards for the next seven generations and so forth. One way to do this is to start, if, if you haven't already, to start to develop a deep connection to place, looking and feeling and being in the place that you live, where you work, play, live, shop and so forth, all of the, all the activities of daily living that you interact with, do you have a connection to that land as you're moving through your day? And people develop a sense of place through experience and knowledge. So you need to be there. You need to be out into the world, out and onto the planet and really experiencing her. A sense of place emerges also through knowledge get to know about your region, know about the history, the geography, the geology, the flora, the fauna, the legends, um, all of the history of the place where you live. Another piece uh, is to become stewards of the land, to really adopt that construct as something that's really helped to reshape Western thought to gain a careful observation of the seasons, the cycles of life around you, to appreciate how things grow and then die and so forth, and they go through cycles, including us as humans, as well as looking at how interdependent all life forms are on one another. And what we do matters. It helps to shape and influence the earth. So for countless generations, the Indigenous people have had a unique, respectful and sacred ties to the land. And this sustained them, and it sustained the land. They never claimed ownership of the earth, but rather declared a sense of stewardship, a sense of responsibility towards the land and all that live on it. This helped to reinforce balance and holistic harmony, and it's an essential tenet of all Indigenous knowledge and subsequent cultural practices. Also, a, a keen belief in adaptability and change, I think, is a really strong um, point to emphasize so that it's not looking to the past, etc. It's blending, bringing the past forward and changing as we need to to help to promote balance and harmony on the earth and not to continue this distress and death and depletion that's been occurring over the last 200 years. So I ask you to ask yourself, what is your footprint on the earth? And not just your carbon footprint, but what is your true ecological footprint on this planet? So look, question yourself, well, how do you impact the health of your environment around you? And to look at learning together and experiential knowledge. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with elders here on the West Coast with our nursing students who have really widened their understanding of Indigenous knowledge, have helped us to weave um, different learning activities into our programs, etc., where nursing students can be taught by experiencing through theory work, practical work, and, and some experiences working with our elder and residents. And by looking at those experiences, it helps them to make meaning of what they've learned and to apply that to nursing care of their clients, as well as with their, their own relationship with the earth. One example is that uh, the elder brought us cedar bark harvesting with the community. 
And the, the particular trees that were being harvested that day were slated to be cut down by BC Hydro. So they consulted with the First Nations people and uh, organized with them that they would take all of the bark. Usually when there's in cedar bark harvesting, they just take some strips from particular trees. But in this case, because the trees were going to be removed, the bark was gathered as well as the logs were gathered and were used for house posts for a community center. So we, this was kind of a unique situation, but they learned um, that the cedar is sacred, that the elders uh, uh, sort of began the harvesting with a prayer and an offering and so forth. And the whole process was done in such a wonderful sense of community and cohesiveness with the trees, etc. So this is just a picture of the bark that was gathered, or some of the bark that was gathered, um, worked together to make these long strips of, of bark, which would then be subdivided into thinner strips and made to make hats, et cetera. And I know that this, uh, the elder's hat that's in the right was actually replaced with cedar that was collected during this, this particular event. Another uh, way of looking at um, relating to bringing, bringing in Indigenous content, et cetera, into education is uh, well represented by the work just recently done by the uh, Canadian Association of Schools of Nursing, focused on nursing and cli uh, climate-driven vector-borne diseases. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, out of this project came some guidelines with competencies that undergraduate nurses are expected to meet uh, related to climate-driven vector-borne diseases, as well as an amazing <clears throat> interactive toolkit and curriculum that's now up on, on the site. And you can see the website address in the bottom right here, bbd.casn.ca. And it's, based, it's called Climate Driven Vector Borne Diseases. So both the competencies and the curriculum are available with nurses in mind, but open to all healthcare uh, students and teachers, et cetera. What uh, resulted was five modules, and I had the honor of working on this as the lead content expert, uh, was done in a way where it, um, Indigenous content was integrated into the modules and also consultation was done by various Indigenous people, as well as people that were on, on the different committees of, um, involved with this initiative. So it, it had both internal and external reviews with different representatives and experts, as well as um, Indigenous content was, was integrated into all five of these modules. So you can see them listed um, in about the middle of the screen where they looked at first climate change general overview, and then vector-borne infectious diseases in Canada, then primary and secondary prevention, uh, fourth one was tertiary prevention, and then awareness and advocacy. And I just get in the next two slides is just an example of some of the content that was part of, part of well, two of the modules. So this first one is looking at how can traditional knowledge inform preservation of health, sustainable actions and environmental stewardship, and the second example is uh, just defining traditional knowledge, et cetera, and why it's important for nurses. So any nursing student that takes this curriculum or any nurse, because it's also open to any um, practicing nurse or physician, et cetera, anyone that wants to take advantage of it, it's free, it's free of charge, et cetera. Why traditional knowledge is important to bring into this conversation and into this curriculum. And so my last point is how we can support Indigenous communities by raising our voice together with them in collective activism. Um, this is a picture, actually this bottom picture is one I took of Idle No More demonstration that was done in, in my hometown quite a few years ago now, um, but to support different initiatives and so forth that often in Indigenous nations are at the forefront of activist movements to protect the land, the water, and the air. Uh, across our whole nation, work is being done to preserve and protect different pollution, crime crisis, and so on. 
And it's just so, again, as I said, there's so many issues that you can support. And I do encourage you to pay attention to what the First Nations peoples are supporting it and to offer your support as well with them. Protection of the oceans, lakes, rivers, and aquifers across this land are also a very high concern to all, virtually all indigenous communities. And this is an example of a, um, a, a group of signs, et cetera, that's almost like a monument right now that's in the old Masset at the top of Haida Gwaii. And at, this was done at the time when Enbridge uh, oil uh, pipeline was being proposed. And as you know, <clears throat> that, that was squelched, which is, which is amazing, but there's still a um, major push to have the Trans Mountain one through, et cetera. And there's a lot of people that are protesting and act, acting out against these. So trying to stop them, et cetera. There's potential oil tanker spills and other chemical contaminants. And as well, there's some natural gas that's being, uh, being fought against as well in here in British Columbia. That's really a major concern and it could use all of our support. And lastly, I wanted to start, um, just showcase CANE, which is Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment, and their ways of integrating support for Indigenous communities, as well as other, other um, activist types of groups and so forth. And one is that the Truth and Reconciliation and Intersectionality Committee uh, right now provides action and resources for nurses that are members and nursing students. We also support for uh, offer support for Indigenous activism by writing letters and so forth that help to support their cause. And also we're looking at partnering with various um, Indigenous groups, such as we've been approached by the Indigenous Climate Action Group, and we're, and we're exploring that uh, partnership as well. So that all of these things could also be embraced by any individual healthcare professionals and so forth. Um, in 2019, Kane looked at the constitution and added uh, objectives where we adopted the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action as being a foundation of our approach to education and advocacy and so forth. And we've made it an active stance to include intersectionality in all of our work. Um, these are just some examples of four letters that we wrote to support various initiatives <clears throat> just recently of, and they're across the nation. This is a, Kane is a national group. It's actually one of the um, Canadian Nurses Association specialty groups. And so there's, we've written letters for the Mi'kmaq as well as uh, peoples in British Columbia and in Ontario and so forth. And we, we will continue to support these initiatives as we can. And this is just my contact information. And thank you very much for allowing me to speak to you. Thank you both so much. So, um, we're going to do a Q&A now um, and just have a little bit of a discussion and answer some questions that have come up. Um, so I'm just going to spotlight both of you. And one second. Oh. Oh. Perfect. OK, I think you should both be spotlighted now. So um, the first question that we have is um, both of you talked about the concept of the next seven generations and protecting our future generations. So how do you think that uh, healthcare students can use that concept both in their clinical practice, but also in working towards planetary health? Yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a great question and i think uh, that intergenerational equity piece is probably you know the the way that it could be knowledge translated into more western kind of terminologies 
um, because it's really about thinking across generations uh, uh, through, through the concept of equity, which is becoming, thankfully, as I had noted before, a little bit more understood and well known in, in many different types of uh, health circles and, and, and even in wider communities as well, uh, with all the diversity, equity and inclusion and kind of all of these, you know, things that have been coming out uh, recently. Um, so if we think about intergenerational equity, just from that lens, um, not necessarily putting aside our, our own context, but you know, most of that is in regard to what I hope was being covered in many of these modules, which is resource stewardship, of course, you know, uh, there's been a, a lot of discussion in medical care practice about, you know, how not only to decarbonize, but also to reduce waste. Um, prevention, of course, because we require much, uh, much less resource intensive care if we're taking care of families, providing good public health and primary care, um, and also providing culturally attuned services that are uh, really meaningful to communities so that we're not having to get to the stage where we're, we're having to do very high intensity treatments. And I think physicians and medical students can be advocates. Uh, we, we probably don't do that enough, I think, as a, at a societal level. We're sort of shunned sometimes into being quiet because our role is in the clinic or wherever it is. But uh, I think physicians, nurses, and other healthcare providers really have an opportunity as, as very trusted members of communities and, and society to, to step up and become advocates in this regard, not only taking into consideration the health of patients, but the health of planet because they are so intertwined. Um, you know, the, I think we could spend probably a six hour seminar and that wouldn't even cut close to, to the discussions on how to implement seven generations in the context of medical practice. But hopefully those and, and some of the previous bits, you know, June covered a lot of them very well as, 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 as well help to maybe stimulate some of those connectivities. And I think another point to consider as well is that children are also very vulnerable, right, to any problems that are going on in the environment. So I think keeping that in, in our minds as we're working with families and so forth, and also as we're advocating, as we're looking at uh, to support advocacy that's out there to protect children's health and so forth. And that's just the one generation. So looking on it, if you're looking at it in seven generations, how are you gonna to help to preserve the planet so that it can be bountiful, et cetera, for seven generations to come? Great, thank you so much to both of you for answering that. Um, our next question is for Dr. Red first. So I know you mentioned the idea of shared decision-making referring to the metered dose inhalers in your presentation. Um, we were just wondering, how do you, how do you, have you found that that conversation goes with patients? Like are patients receptive to that? And when you go through the pros and cons of each treatment, how does that work? Yeah, I, I think the, I always try to figure out ways, you know, to use these Western methods that, that essentially describe what our communities, you know, communities have done for thousands of years and, and shared decision-making is sort of probably one of the closest, although there's still, you know, not quite a complete connectivity with it, that really describes this sort of consensus relational process that occurs. Because in shared decision making, it's it's supposed to, if it's done properly, really eliminate or reduce some of the power differentials that come from a physician, you know, making a prescription and saying you need to do this, 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 because, you know, I'm the expert and, and um, you know, I know what's best, which historically was, was kind of the case in, in medicine, where we finally come to this point now where a lot of systems recognize that the best way to get value is to understand patients as experts in their own lives and how to be able to, to leverage and really glean from them their story and narrative of what their goals are and, and what their intents are um, for health and potentially even be opening to, open to involving family members or community as a part of the, the, the culture um, that's embodied, at, at least from an indigenous context. So 
thinking through that, bringing in the, bringing in the planet to the exam room, because that's really what it's about. And, and I'm actually doing a study right now, interviewing physicians asking exactly that, you know, uh, from a Western perspective, physicians that may not necessarily be embodied in these collective worldviews and in these relational worldviews, you know, how do they feel about bringing up these kinds of pros and cons, as you noted, with, with, with patients who may or may not be receptive to that conversation. And, and, you know, for the most part, I've seen at least, you know, physicians comment that, you know, yeah, there, there might be patients that will come back wondering what the relevance is as a part of that. But, you know, there's tricks, tricks and processes in, in how you create story and, and how you bring in those aspects of thinking through pros and cons, starting off with patients, but also bringing in these auxiliary pieces that they may not necessarily have thought about. If it's shared decision-making, if they don't take that into account, we can't force them, of course, but at least it's it's in their mind now. You've planted that little seed of thought, you know, is my hope. Um, but most of the time I find people fairly receptive, but, but I should say that I'm probably biased because the people that, you know, I was usually seeing in clinical practice would come knowing probably that that was part of the way that I, that I practice care. Um, so hence the, the research project right now, really to try to get some of those angles and experiences from those that, that may not see patients that come for those relational kinds of, kinds of reasons. But I think the more that it's common knowledge, um, my hope is to see more patient advocacy done so that patients know some of these pros and cons in general society, that it becomes more normal to have these conversations. It's not such a, such a um, uh, sensitive thing that, that, that occurs. Um, but, but it's an interesting question. I, you know, I'm, I'm very curious to see how the further discussions will happen in this project. Yeah, that'll be really interesting to hear people's perspectives on that and see if there's been a change too between you know, in previous and going forward, because I think it is becoming definitely more on patients' minds as well. Um, June, we have a question for you um, that asks, how can nurses demonstrate respect for Indigenous ways, specifically in hospital settings, so from a nursing perspective? Well, definitely, I would encourage uh, inclusion of, you know, I know a lot of different hospitals and health authorities I know out in British Columbia here, we have now the First Nations Health Authority, which is doing a beautiful job of integrating First Nations knowledge and, and approaches to healthcare into all of the different health authorities, though that they're still in the beginning stages and so forth. But I think nurses and nursing students and so forth need to learn a lot more about one the history of healthcare and, and uh, Indigenous experience and so forth, but also their ways of wanting to heal, their ways of being and so forth, how they want to be treated. And as you, you're probably all aware, cultural safety and humility and so forth has become a mandate in most provinces now that all, all health professionals practice this. So, and also, as you know, there's probably a long history of racism and discrimination and so forth that needs to stop now. Um, it's still quite rampant in many situations, and it, it cannot be abided and so forth. So I think that there's a whole reshaping of applying these principles, like the respect and so forth. All of these principles will, will, should be applied to every interaction you have with an Indigenous client. Um, I know I've, I've been working with um, a couple of Indigenous communities in research and health research with a, a well-known rheumatologist out here in British Columbia. And the way that she's approached this work has been quite amazing. Everything right from the beginning of the design of the research was done in consultation with communities it was meant for and so forth. And both traditional and Western ways have been incorporated and so forth. I think it's really, really important to definitely open your eyes to both, both ways. And again, it's been, it's kind of a catch phrase right now is two-eyed seeing to adopt that in all of your interactions and not just with indigenous clients, but I think indigenous ways can help you deal with clients of, of all nationalities and so forth. They're, they're very powerful. Thank you so much. I answered your question. Yeah, that was amazing. Thanks so much, June. Um, our next question is again for both of you and this is kind of a fun question. So what are your next projects going forward and what are, your, what are you most excited about? Yeah. 
have all day. <laughs> to way too many projects on the go. But, but, but I think probably one of the projects that I'm most excited about, it, it's an ongoing project, but it's always evolving, is the, the work of uh, uh, the foundation that I co-created with two elders uh, up in the NWT, which is the Arctic Indigenous Wellness Foundation. Uh, and we've been running an urban land-based healing camp now for going on almost four years. Um, and we're, we're at the point now where we're, we're going to be starting to capture a little bit more of the narratives of the impact that that camp has had, not only on community members, but also on relationships to, to land, despite being in an urban place where, you know, a lot of our unhoused relatives may be disconnected from land based or from their communities and cultures, but have been still able to, you know, have that as part of their lived experience with this camp and engage in cultural programs that, that really root them back to their, their, their community origins and their original instructions, if we could say. Um, and I'm very excited about starting to mobilize some of those narratives a little bit more formally within, within the work of the camp. Um, and, and I think uh, there's going to be some great lessons learned coming and, and listening to the stories of, of the people that ha have been through there and, and have benefited from, from the space. Oh, and for me, I, I have a very curriculum focused agenda, basically, with my work nowadays. So both looking at fleshing out our nursing curriculum more where, where I teach, but also as um, Kane's communication officer, and also their education committee chair, uh, looking at ways that we can share more curriculum and, and education resources for schools, not just of nursing, but you know, of any kind of healthcare discipline. And I would really like to, to make sure that Indigenous knowing is a strong component of that and, and helps to guide that. That's basically where I'm at right now. Thank you both so much for um, answering that question. It's really excited to hear about what's going forward and what you're looking forward to um, over the next little while. And I think everyone will be sure to keep their eyes out um, for those going forward. So um, we just want to thank both of you so much um, for being here today and taking the time out of your day to talk to us about um, uh, your you know area of passion. And we're really appreciative of it. So. We're going to um, wrap up there and we just want to remind everyone that um, if you would please, if you are interested in participating in the um, speaker series certificate, to please fill out um, your certificate series um, reflection uh, that's due next week and we'll get uh, looking at those next week and otherwise just want to say thank you to everyone um, for participating and for asking questions and for um, being excited uh, to be here so we really appreciate it.